Is there a word from the Lord? Yes, there is a word from the Lord. Get your Bible, your notepad, your pen, your pencil. Let's dig into the word. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Well, hello everybody and welcome once again to this special time in God's Word. I'm Dr. Sheldon D. Newton, coming to you from Jesus Christ Centered Ministries International, located right here in beautiful Nassau, Bahamas. We want to welcome all of Jesus Christ Centered Ministries International members and partners, all of our followers, those of you who are listening today, welcome one and all. Let's pray together and get right into God's Word. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. We ask you in Jesus' name, grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Cause our eyes to be open to see what we've not yet seen, our ear to hear what we've not yet heard, our hearts to understand. We thank you for it now, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go back in our Bibles, please, to the book of Revelation. And we are now on Revelation chapter number 11. Revelation chapter number 11. By the way, if you're just tuning in for the first time, we do encourage you to go back and look at some of the um, beginning lessons that we've taught along this line so that you can get a good basic foundation of the book of Revelation. It is vitally important that we are understand the things that are um, understandable from this particular book because these things concern the last days. Now we have just covered concerning how um, John had an experience when an angel of the Lord, a big angel, a mighty angel of the Lord appeared to him. Uh, this angel came down from heaven, took his, um, had one foot on the earth and the other foot on the sea and the angel had a little book in his hand and John was told to eat that little book and when he ate that little book, uh, um, the angel told him, he said, now in your mouth it will be sweet as honey, he said, but in your belly it will be bitter and what this was referring to was that God's word is sweet as honey uh, um, the Bible talks about his word being as sweet as honey to our taste glory to God and those of us who do spend time in the word of God on a daily basis as the Spirit of God opens the word to our hearts we can attest to the fact that God's word is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb glory be to God all right so um, in, uh, um, when John eats it um, the angel said it'll be in your mouth sweet as honey because it is God's word he said but in your belly it'll be bitter because it, it really was a book that was filled with cons um, judgment concerning the wrath of God being poured out upon ungodly men about upon um, rebellious men all right rebellious mankind now um, let me read again chapter 10 chapter 10 and notice again he said in verse number 10 I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey and as soon as I'd eaten it my belly was bitter and he said unto me thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and kings and tongues and kings now we pointed out there that at this time John was in his 90s and this angel was telling him you got to prophesy or speak again or preach again to many people and tongues and, pe and kings and nations which means that in the kingdom as long as you are on this planet there is work to do. You have work to do for the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? So you may say, oh, I, I'm, but I'm retiring. You may retire from being the pastor of a church because, simply put, you've trained someone else to handle that church, but you can never retire from ministry. Once you've received the call of God to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is something that you have to do, something that you have to fill, fulfill until the Lord comes or until you go to be with Him, all right? There's no such thing as total retirement in the kingdom, all right? So I, I just pray that that bless you. It means that if you are older and you're thinking, oh, um, I've already um, uh, I'm trained someone and passed on the work, so I'm now just, what am I to do now? There's more work for you to do. Ask the Lord to show you what else he has for you to do because there's more work in the kingdom for you to do. See, you have to understand something with God. Faithfulness is the mark that God uses to determine to use you more and more and more and more and more. Faithful, faithfulness is the mark. And so John had been faithful in doing what the Lord called him to do. And Jesus now appears to him um, in his 90s and gives him the book of Revelation. And here he is being told, you, you still got some more to do. You got to prophesy. You know, you ain't finished yet, John. 
Hallelujah. And so, I mean, this should be a great inspiration to all the preachers to let them know there's more for you to do. You have to pass on more of your wisdom to young preachers. Many young preachers today are needing more, a lot of wisdom. And the older ones are the ones who have that wisdom that the younger preachers need. So, even if you are passed on the work to others, then you need to start probably doing ministers' conferences for younger ministers and, and teaching and training. Probably you need to just try and congregate with a couple of younger men, younger ministers, and deposit in them the things that the Lord has taught you through these many years. I, I thank God there's a man of God who I know, and before this pandemic and the restaurants closed down, he would be meeting with us younger ministers on a constant basis. I mean, it was like every week, uh, five days, four to five days a week, he would be faithful to be there. And if you were there and you were asked him concerning questions uh, of things that you wanted to understand, and he would be joyful and happy to impart to us um, younger ministers uh, um, things that he had learned, things that he knew. Uh, and listen, it can save you years to learn the wisdom of those who have already walked the path and who have experience in the ministry. It can save you years. You can, you can learn some things that would have taken you years to learn. You know, and so never put it in your mind or your heart that you know all there is to know or that you know more than everybody. Always keep a teachable spirit, especially if you're a young minister, but even older ones. Always keep a teachable spirit. Always keep a teachable spirit. Always keep a teachable spirit. Always be in an attitude that there is more to learn because there is more to learn. Praise the Lord. So John was, um, um, I don't know if he had retirement on his mind or not, but according to what we just read here, um, he wasn't going to retire. He had more work to do. All right, and he was in his 90s, so there's hope for you, praise the Lord. Now, in chapter 11, and, and he's still on earth. These experiences that he's having from chapter 10 and in chapter 11 are happening on the earth. There are things that are going on simultaneously in heaven and in earth, all right? In heaven, in the heavenlies, as we'll see in chapter 12, and in the earth. But in chapter 11, he is now in uh, 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 um, Jerusalem, and you'll find that as we read, you'll see that's where he is. It says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, really a measuring stick, okay? And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. Now this is not the temple of God in heaven. This is the temple of God in Jerusalem, all right? That temple will be built again. That temple will be built. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, um, John was told to measure the temple and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, uh, the outer court, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, see that's Jerusalem, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, I'm going to say some things in just a moment. I, I don't want to say them quite yet, uh, um, but we'll get to them in just a moment. And he says, and I will give power God talking here through the angel, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in. Um, and by the way, three hundred. I mean, three score means uh, sixty. Okay, so one thousand three hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two um, candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And now, uh, let me go a little further, let me go a little further. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoured their enemies. And if any man will kill them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have, shall have finished their testimony, the beast that descended, that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead body shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, you can find it in yourself, and we're going to go back here a minute because I want to get some things over. But you can find it in yourself, right? Uh, find it yourself right over in the book of Isaiah chapter 1, that Jerusalem is um, called, um, symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, all right? So he's talking about Jerusalem, all right? Now, go back with me a minute and notice carefully that John is told to measure the temple in Jerusalem, 
to measure the temple, and then he's told concerning uh, uh, um, how the temple would be trodden under the foot of the Gentiles for what? For uh, 40 and 2 months. Now, I, I want to make sure I get that. Verse number 2. And the holy city shall they create underfoot 40 and 2 months. Now, 40 and 2 months here is speaking of 3 and a half years. The tribulation period is actually a period of 7 years. And we're going to find that out um, when we get even further into chapter 12. It's a period of 3 and a half years. I mean, 7 years. Um, the first half of that tribulation period the Antichrist who will reveal himself will reveal himself as if he is a man of peace. All right? To reveal himself. You're going to find this. Uh, um, we're going to go into the book of Matthew 24 and we're going to go into the book of Revelation chapter number 12, 13, and 14. And you, you'll see that these things are laid out in Scripture. I'm just trying to give you uh, a basic understanding of what he's talking about here in chapter 11 so that when we get into chapter 12 uh, and you begin to see, everything will start to come together and you'll understand it. All right? So uh, the tribulation period is period seven years. For those first three and a half years, um, the Antichrist is going to reveal himself as if he is a man of peace. Uh, um, remember in the book of Revelation chapter 6, he's going to come on a white horse. He's going to come as if he's as if he's Messiah, you see. And the Jews uh, are, are going to think that, they, that he is uh, um, their friend, that he is the Messiah, or that he is a, 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 a man of God. They're, they're really going to think highly of him, and they're going to accept him. Now you have to remember, as far as the whole Jewish nation is concerned, they don't see Jesus as Messiah. Uh, um, you know, the Pharisees and those ha had convinced them that, that, Messiah, that Jesus was dead, that Jesus was not the Messiah. So even though Jesus arose from the dead and gave proof that he arose from the dead, the majority of the Jewish nation still to this day do not believe that Jesus Christ was actually the Messiah. But when the Antichrist comes as this man of peace, trying to say that he's bringing peace to the world, the Jews are going to accept him. Now, when we get into chapter 12, I'm going to keep carry you, like I said, and prove it out to you that they are going to accept him, but they are not, they are, their eyes are going to be open when he determines that he is going into the temple of God in Jerusalem and that he's going to sit on the seat that was reserved, you know, for Jehovah. That's where he's wanting to sit. They, he, they're going to think he's their Messiah, but he wants to sit on Jehovah's seat. As a matter of fact, um, just hold your hand there and go right back over to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And I'll prove that out to you real quickly. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Notice here, um, uh, let's start from verse number... Mm, verse number 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Talking about the time of, uh, of the judgment of God, the time of the day of the Lord. Uh, um, and we'll get into that later. Um, shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin, that's the Antichrist, be revealed. The son of perdition, who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God. Or that is worshipped. So that he asks God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's what the Antichrist is going to try and do. And see, that is something that the Jewish people uh, are not expecting. They do not see uh, him as God. They see him maybe as Messiah, but not as God Almighty, you see? And so... Uh, um, um, go over, please, to the book of Matthew. I might as well do this now. Go to Matthew chapter number 24. And the Antichrist is called the abomination of desolation. Now, this was not something that, that Jesus came up with on his own, uh, um, you know, just pulled that name out. He was actually quoting based on things that had been revealed to Daniel. So when we get in further into our study, like I said, when we get into chapter 12, we're going to go back to the book of Daniel, and we're going to see where um, it speaks of the abomination that make it desolate. So Jesus called the Antichrist the abomination of desolation. And he's going to say that he got that from the book of Daniel. Watch this. Of course, he gave the revelation to Daniel as well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But that's a whole other subject. But notice here in verse number 15. 
Jesus is telling these disciples, they asked him three questions in chapter one to, uh, um, chapter 24, verses 1 to 3. They said, Jesus, they carried Jesus and showed him all the buildings and temple. And you know, they were proud of that temple. And Jesus said, you see all these things? He said, not one stone will be left upon another. And they asked him later. Now, Peter, James, and John were the ones who actually asked him on the side. If you read it, I think, from the book of Mark or the book of Luke. Peter, James, and John, okay? And I think Andrew may have been there too. But it wasn't the whole twelve who asked him. But they did ask him. They said, uh, when shall these things be? These were the three questions. And what shall be the sign of your coming? And what shall be the sign of the end of the world? So he took this entire 24th and 25th chapter and began to answer their questions, you see. And in the middle of that, in verse number 15, here's what Jesus said. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. See, you have to go back to Daniel now. You see, but spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand this abomination of desolation when you see him stand in the holy place. Then he said, Whoso read it, let him understand. He said, Once you see him stand or in that temple and wanting to go sit on that throne in that temple as if he is God, he said, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, you're going to get into that, like I said, when we get in chapter 12, you're going to get into where the Jews are going to have to run for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. The Antichrist is going to try and wipe out, completely wipe out the Jewish nation. But God is is going to be their protector, all right? And so uh, um, I just wanted to show you that I wasn't just talking off the top of my head. Um, the 42 months spoken of is the last half of the three and a half years of the seven year tribulation period. The last half of the seven year tribulation period. The first three and a half years, he's gonna act like a man of peace, and people are gonna think he's a man of peace, and the Jews are gonna think he's their Messiah. But that last three and a half years, once their eyes are open and they realize who he is, he's going to go on a major killing spree and he's going to have the whole nations of the world behind him as he tries to wipe out every Jew and as he tries to wipe out every person that names the name of Christ. Now thank God for those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior now. We'll have already been raptured or caught away out of here. And someone just recently asked me, is rapture the word rapture in the Bible? But it's not the word rapture that's there. The word that the words that are there is caught up or caught away. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 16, you see? Uh, but that word caught away is the Latin term. That is the word rapture, you see? That's what it means, raptured. So when we speak of the rapture of the church, we're speaking of the catching away of the saints, as Paul said it, all right? Now, uh, the church will have been raptured, and now you're going to have where this three and a half years period of, of, of untold terror on the earth, where the Jews are being are being um, targeted to be wiped out, out uh, um, and destroyed, and where Christians who are um, what we term great tribulation saints, people who got saved after the rapture of the church, they are going to have to uh, um, go through a whole lot of torture, and according to Revelations chapter 6 and 7, they will be killed for their faith. The Antichrist will find them, and he will kill them, but they're going to end up coming to heaven because they gave their lives to Christ. So, uh, um, thank God there's still hope even after the rapture of the church. But why take that risk? Why take that risk of having to um, go through such torture for your faith when you can give your life to Jesus Christ right now and be ready for the catching away of the saints? Oh, glory be to God. Now, let's go back to Revelation uh, as we prepare. Uh, uh, um, to close this segment. I know that you're saying, oh my God, uh, Bishop, don't close. We got a whole, I mean, we, you know, this is so good. We got to go through this whole thing and we got to learn more and more. Just let's keep going. But we want to give you the piece of the time and pray, pray fully, prayerfully. You're going to go back over it and listen to it and take your Bible and look at these scriptures and mark these scriptures and, and gain some understanding so that by the time we get back together again, all of us are on the same page. I, I know that there are times when people tend to think that they understand what you say. Um, um, and I've had it happen. I've had it uh, um, happen where you see people think they understand. But as they talk, you realize uh, um, why you have to continually go over the same thing over and over. Because people don't get it the first time you say it, the second time you say it, the third time you say it. In the education system, they say repetition is the mother of learning. I found that to be the truth even in the kingdom. All right? Uh, but notice here, back in Revelation chapter number 12, as we prepare to close, 
us, praise the Lord, that he also speaks there, um, chapter 11, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 11, he also speaks there of two witnesses that will come during the last part of the Great Tribulation period. Now, what is interesting here is that there is a whole lot of debate a whole lot of debate on who these two witnesses are. And um, there are people who think that the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. Then there are, two, there are people who think that it's Enoch and Elijah. Uh, and the question becomes, well, who are they? Well, the interesting answer to that is, we for sure don't know. All right? We for sure, God didn't name them. He just said they're going to be two. And we're going to show you when we get together next week. We're going to show you from the book of Zechariah that they had been prophesied about. That's why he said these are the two candlesticks and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord. He's referring back to uh, the book of Zechariah and a vision that Zechariah had seen. And so we're going to get into that next week. And we're going to take a possible look at why people tend to think that the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. And, then, and why people tend to think that it's Enoch. And Elijah, we'll we'll take a look at uh, um, possible reasons why, and then um, we're gonna say uh, we're gonna leave it to the Lord to let His two witnesses come in their time to do what they're supposed to do, whoever they are, uh, uh, and we're not gonna try and be um, dogmatic on this end because we don't have uh, um, where God named them for us to be dogmatic. How whoever they are. They are brethren, whoever they are, they are men of God. Whoever they are, they're going to be operating in an authority and a power and an anointing that can only come from heaven. Hey, listen, bow your heads with me a moment. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, just pray this prayer. Mean it from, with all your heart. Mean it with your heart. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins according to the Scripture. I believe you were buried. I believe the Father raised you from the dead. Right now I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Wash me from my sins in your precious blood. Seal me with your Holy Spirit and make me your child. And I give you the glory, I give you the thanks, and I give you the praise for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're so glad you've joined us for this broadcast today and we trust that the Word of God has made an impact upon your life that will never be erased. Hey, listen, if you enjoyed this Word from the Lord, please subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss out on other uh, um, um, teachings of the Word of God that we put forward. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we'd love to stand in agreement in prayer with you. Listen, God still answers prayer. So if you have any prayer requests, please email us at the email address on the screen and let us know. We want to be praying for you. Until we meet again around the Word of God, remember, Jesus Christ is Lord and divine love. Lord.